Okay, so in this video, what I want to do is formally prove the least squares formula. If you recall from the previous video, we saw that when in the least squares problem, when we're trying to minimize the RSS, the beta that minimizes this is given by this matrix equation here, where A and Y, A is a matrix and Y is a vector. Now, to prove this, we just need to review some pretty basic multiple variable calculus, which hopefully you've taken before this class. Now, when we review this, the first thing we want to review are just the gradients of multiple variable functions, in case you don't recall it from your calculus class. And one thing we're going to show here is that what we want to do when you minimize a function is to set the gradient to zero. To that end, we're going to compute the gradient of the RSS and then solve for the beta that where the gradient is zero. Okay, so let's start on the first part, which is reviewing gradients of multiple variable functions. Now, for a gradient, is just defined like this. Suppose we have any function. It could be RSS or any function, which is a function of some vector of variables. Importantly, this is a scalar valued function, meaning that it takes n inputs and produces one output, like RSS. The gradient is just a column vector, where it has n components, which are the partial derivatives of that function with respect to each one of the inputs to that function. Now, you can think of the gradient geometrically. For each point beta, it produces a vector. So if we had a function that was a function of two variables, say beta 1 and beta 2, at each point beta 1, beta 2, the gradient would be a vector. So the vector would have a direction and a magnitude like this, which we could draw like these arrows. Now, there's a couple of important properties about the gradient that's useful for minimization. The first is that the direction of the gradient will always point in the direction of maximum increase. So, for example, if we go back to this simple picture here, you see there's a kind of valley on the left and a hill on the top. And the gradient points in the direction of moving up out of the valley towards the top of that hill. So it's the steepest ascent direction of the function. We're going to talk about this actually extensively in a couple units more when we talk about nonlinear minimization. The second property about it is that at any local minima or maxima, the gradient is zero. So for example, here on the top, if you're at the bottom of the valley or you're at the top of the hill, you see that the arrow goes to zero. Similarly, in a one-dimensional case here, you see that the derivative, which is the gradient in this case, is also zero at the top, it's a zero at the bottom. Now, that means that if we want to find where the function is a minimum, we can just set the gradient equal to zero and solve for the beta which does this. You'll have to solve for n values of beta and you'll get n equations. So you solve n equations and n unknowns. Now, before we go on, I just want to do a quick, simple gradient calculation of a very simple function just so that uh, we're all clear about how to compute gradients. Okay, let's just do a very quick example so you understand how to do a gradient. So here we have a function, um, which is a function of two variables, x1 and x2. And for each value of x1 and x2, you get a scalar output by this equation here. All right, so let's just compute its gradient. To compute its gradient, we need to compute the partial derivative of f with respect to each one of these variables. So first, let's look at df of by x1, oops, by x1. So all you do to compute a partial derivative is you do it like a regular derivative, treating x2 or any other variables as constants. So if you recall from calculus, the derivative with a sine of x1 is just cos, and this now we're just going to treat as a constant. So that will be 2x2 cos of x1. This has no dependence on 
x1, so the derivative of this is 0, and here the 5x2 is just treated like a constant, so it will be minus 5x2. Similarly, if I take the derivative with respect to x2, I'm just going to know the sine of x1 is all just like a constant. This is just going to be 2 sine of x1, and if you recall the derivative of a polynomial will just be 6 times x2, and this one here will be 5 times x1. Now the gradient then of f with respect to x, sorry that was the wrong notation, the gradient with respect to f at a vector x will just be the vector with these two components. So it'll be 2 x2 cos of x1 minus 5 of x2. That's the first component. And the second component is 2 sine of x1 plus 6 of x2 minus 5 of x1. Okay, let's prove the formula for the least squares solution. So let's recall that we have our linear model, that is y hat i is the sum over the parameters beta j times the transform features a i j. And we have the residual sum of squares, which are our obje objective, and that is just the sum over all the samples of y i minus y hat i. That is the sum squared of the differences between the measured value and the predicted value. Now, what we want to do to minimize the um, RSS is that we want to minimize this with respect to the parameters. So we want to take the partial derivative of the residual sum of squares with respect to each parameter beta j. Now, this is actually not that hard. It looks maybe a little difficult, but it's just calculus. The first thing to do is that you remember that for any time you have a derivative, you can use linearity and bring the derivative inside. So we're just, just taking the derivative like this of the inside of this. Here we next use chain rule. Remember that for chain rule, we can just say that's 2 times the difference. Oops, don't need this anymore. And times the derivative of this guy here. Oops. By the parameter beta j. Now remember that yi is constant. It doesn't depend on, on beta j. So that implies that its derivative respect to beta j is 0. On the other hand, we know that y hat i is the sum over, I'm just going to write it slightly differently with a different index k, just to look at this derivative a little easier, more easily. All right, when we want to take the derivative here, it's a little hard, but if you just keep track of things, you'll figure it out. I want to know... This, this is a sum over the p terms of beta j. Which term would um, correspond to beta j? Well, that's, of course, the term where k is equal to j. So that means here that the derivative of y hat i by beta j is just a i j, because it's a term corresponding to the term with k equal to j. All right, so when we put these guys in here, that just means that the derivative with respect to the residual sum of squares of beta j is just going to be the sum over the samples i of 2 of y i minus y hat i times the derivative of y i, which is just 0, minus the derivative of y j with respect to this, which is a i j. Well, let's just, we can write it like this taking that minus out, yi minus y hat i 
times a i j. Okay, now I want to set that this derivative has to be zero for all um, uh, for all uh, j. That means we want d r r r s s by d beta j is equal to zero for all j. Now what that means is I'm going to show you that this, if I set this equal to zero, first of all, I can just forget about that minus two. That means I really just want, that's the same as just saying that the sum over i of a i j of y i minus y hat i is equal to zero um, for all j. But let's take a look at this carefully. If you think of this, this is really the same as the following in matrix form. It's kind of telling me that DRRS, or let's write it like this, says here that if I look at A transpose of Y vector minus Y hat is equal to zero. Why is that the case? Because if you think about what is A transpose, that is going to be the matrix. A transpose will be A11 like this to A N1 because I'm taking that transpose and then I'll have A um, 1 P to A N P like that. This is the matrix A transpose, right? And then I have here Y1 minus Y hat 1 up to Y N minus Y hat N. And you see here that when you multiply these guys out, you multiply the row here by this column like this, I end up with exactly these uh, expressions here. So this guy here is just equal to zero. But if this is the case here, that means I have that if A transpose Y has to equal A transpose Y hat. But we also have, remember, that Y hat is equal to A beta. And when you substitute that into the equation above, you have that A transpose Y is equal to A transpose A times beta. Or just solving for beta, we have that beta is A oops, transpose A inverse A transpose Y. And that proves our result.